Story One of The Doom of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Doom of London by Fred M. White. Story One The Four White Days. A Tale of London in the Grip of an Arctic Winter showing the danger any winter might bring from famine, cold, and fire. 1. The editor of the Daily Chat wondered a little vaguely why he had come down to the office at all. Here was the thermometer down to eleven degrees, with every prospect of touching zero before daybreak, and you can't fill a morning paper with weather reports. Besides, nothing was coming in from the north of the Trent beyond the curt information that all telegraphic and telephonic communication beyond was impossible. There was a huge blizzard, a heavy fall of snow nipped hard by the terrific frost and silence. Tomorrow, January 25th, would see a pretty poor paper unless America roused up to a sense of her responsibility and sent something hot to go on with. The Land's End cables often obliged in that way. There was the next chapter of the Beef and Bread Trust, for instance. Was Silas X. Brett going to prove successful in his attempt to corner the world's supply? That Brett had been a pawnbroker's assistant a year ago mattered little. That he might at any time emerge a penniless adventurer mattered less. From a press point of view, he was good for three columns. The chief sub came in, blowing his fingers. The remark that he was frozen to the marrow caused no particular sympathy. "'Going to be a funeral rag tomorrow, the editor said curtly. "'That's so,' Guff admitted cheerfully. "'We've drawn a thrilling picture of the Thames impassable to craft, and well it might be after a week of this Arctic weather. For days not a carcass or a sack of flour has been brought in. Under the circumstances we were justified in prophesying a bread and meat famine.' and we've had our customary jibe at Silas X. Brett. But still, it's poor stuff. The editor thought he would go home. Still he dallied, on the off chance of something turning up. It was a little after midnight when he began to catch the suggestion of excitement that seemed to be simmering in the sub-editor's room. There was a clatter of footsteps outside. By magic, the place began to hum like a hive. "'What have you struck, Goff? the editor cried. Guff came tumbling in, a sheaf of flimsies in his hand. "'Brett's burst!' he gasped. "'It's a real godsend, Mr. Fisher. I've got enough here to make three columns. Brett's committed suicide!' Fisher slipped out of his overcoat. Everything comes to the man who waits. He ran his trained eyes over the flimsies. He could see his way to a pretty elaboration. "'The danger of the corner is over,' he said later but the fact remains that we are still short of supplies. There are few provision ships on the seas, and if they were close at hand they couldn't get into port with all this ice about. Don't say that London is on the verge of a famine, but you can hint it." Goff winked slightly and withdrew. An hour later, and the presses were kicking and coughing away in earnest. There was a flaming contents bill, so that Fisher went off drowsily through the driving snow Bedford Square way, with a feeling that there was not much the matter with the world after all. It was piercing cold. The wind had come up from the east. The steely blue skies of the last few days had gone. Fisher doubled before the wind that seemed to grip his very soul. On reaching home, he shuddered as he hung over the stove in the hall. "'My word!' he muttered, as he glanced at the barometer. "'Down half an inch since dinner-time.' and a depression on top that you could lie on. Don't ever recollect London under the lash of a real blizzard, but it's come now." A blast of wind, as he spoke, shook the house like some unreasoning fury. 2. It was in the evening of the 24th of January that the first force of the snowstorm swept London. There had been no sign of any abatement in the gripping frost, but the wind had suddenly shifted to the east and almost immediately snow had commenced to fall, but as yet there was no hint of the coming calamity. A little after midnight the full force of the gale was blowing. The snow fell in powder so fine that it was almost imperceptible, 
but gradually the mass deepened until at daybreak it lay some eighteen inches in the streets. Some of the thoroughfares facing the wind were swept bare as a newly reaped field, in others the drifts were four or five feet in height. A tearing, roaring, blighting wind was still blowing as the grey day struggled in. The fine snow still tinkled against glass and brick. By nine o'clock hundreds of telephone wires were broken. The snow and the force of the wind had torn them away bodily. As far as could be ascertained at present, the same thing had happened to the telegraphic lines. At eleven o'clock nothing beyond local letters had been delivered, and the postal authorities notified that no telegrams could be guaranteed in any direction outside the radius. There was nothing from the continent at all. Still, there appeared to be no great cause for alarm. The snow must cease presently. There was absolutely no business doing in the city, seeing that three-fourths of the suburban residents had not managed to reach London by two o'clock. An hour later it became generally known that no main-line train had been scheduled at a single London terminus since midday. Deep cuttings and tunnels were alike rendered impassable by drifted snow. But the snow would cease presently. It could not go on like this. Yet when dusk fell, it was still coming down in the same grey whirling powder. That night London was as a city of the dead. Except where the force of the gale had swept bare patches, the drifts were high, so high in some cases that they reached to the first-floor windows. A half-hearted attempt had been made to clear the roadways earlier in the day, but only two or three main roads running north and south and east and west were at all passable. Meanwhile, the gripping frost never abated a jot. The thermometer stood steadily at fifteen degrees below freezing, even in the forenoon. The ordinary tweed clothing of the average Briton was sorry stuff to keep out a wind like that. But for the piercing draught, the condition of things might have been tolerable. London had experienced colder weather so far as degrees went, but never anything that battered and gripped like this. And still the fine white powder fell. After dark, the passage from one main road to another was a real peril. Belated stragglers fought their way along their own streets without the slightest idea of locality. The dazzle of the snow was absolutely blinding. In sheltered corners, the authorities had set up blazing fires for the safety of the police and public. Hardly a vehicle had been seen in the streets for hours. At the end of the first four and twenty hours, the mean fall of snow had been four feet. Narrow streets were piled up with the white powder. Most of the thoroughfares on the south side of the Strand were mere grey ramparts. Here and there people could be seen looking anxiously out of upper windows and beckoning for assistance. Such was the spectacle that London presented at daybreak on the second day. It was not till near midday of the 26th of January that the downfall ceased. For thirty-six hours the gale had hurled its force mercilessly over London. There had been nothing like it in the memory of man, nothing like it on record. The thin rack of cloud cleared, and the sun shone down on the brilliant scene. A strange, still, weird London. A white deserted city, with a hardy pedestrian here and there, who looked curiously out of place in a town where one expects to see the usual toiling millions. And yet the few people who were about did not seem to fit into the picture. The crunch of their feet on the crisp snow was an offence, the muffled hoarseness of their voices jarred. London woke uneasily with a sense of coming disaster. By midday the continuous frost rendered the snow quite firm enough for traffic. The curious sight of people climbing out of their bedroom windows and sliding down snow mountains into the streets excited no wonder. As to the workaday side of things, that was absolutely forgotten. For the nonce, Londoners were transformed into Laplanders, whose first and foremost idea was food and warmth. So far as could be ascertained, the belt of the blizzard had come from the east in a straight line, some thirty miles wide. Beyond St. Albans there was very little snow, the same remark applying to the south from Red Hill, but London itself lay in the centre of a grip of arctic, ice-bound country and was almost as inaccessible to the outside world as the North Pole itself. 
There was practically no motive power beyond that of the underground railways, and most of the lighting standards had been damaged by the gale. Last calamity of all, the frost affected the gas so that evening saw London practically in darkness. But the great want of many thousands was fuel. Coal was there at the wharfs, but getting it to its destination was quite another thing. It was very well for a slight sleigh and horse to slip over the frozen snow, but a heavily laden cart would have found progression an absolute impossibility. Something might have been done with the electric trams, but all overhead wires were down. In addition to this, the great grain wharfs along the Thames were very low. Local contractors and merchants had not been in the least frightened by the vagaries of Mr. Silas X. Brett. They had bought short, feeling pretty sure that sooner or later their foresight would be rewarded. Therefore they had been trading from hand to mouth. The same policy had been pursued by the small rings of wholesale meat merchants who supply pretty well the whole of London with fresh food. The great majority of the struggling classes pay the American prices and get American produce, an enormous supply of which is in daily demand. Here Silas X. Brett had come in again. Again the wholesale men had declined to make contracts except from day to day. Last and worst of all, the Thames, the chief highway for supplies, was, for the only time in the memory of living man, choked with ice below Greenwich. London was in a stage of siege, as close and gripping as if a foreign army had been at her gates. Supplies were cut off, and were likely to be for some days to come. The price of bread quickly advanced to nine pence the loaf, and it was impossible to purchase the cheapest meat under two shillings per pound. Bacon and flour, and such like provisions, rose in a corresponding ratio. Coal was offered at two pounds per ton, with the proviso that the purchaser must fetch it himself. Meanwhile, there was no cheering news from the outside. London seemed to be cut off from the universe. It was as bad as bad could be, but the more thoughtful could see that there was worse to follow. 3. The sight of a figure staggering up a snowdrift to a bedroom window in Keppel Street aroused no astonishment in the breast of a stolid policeman. It was the only way of entry into some of the houses in that locality. Yet a little further on the pavements were clear and hard. Besides, the figure was pounding on the window, and burglars don't generally do that. Presently the sleeper within awoke. From the glow of his oil stove he could see that it was past twelve. "'Something gone wrong at the office?' Fisher muttered. "'Hang the paper! Why bother about publishing chat this weather?' He rolled out of bed and opened the window, draught of icy air caught his heart in a grip like death for the moment. Goff scrambled into the room and made haste to shut out the murderous air. "'Nearly five below zero, he said. "'You must come down to the office, Mr. Fisher.' Fisher lit the gas. Just for the moment he was lost in admiration of Goff's figure. His head was muffled in a rag torn from an old sealskin jacket. He was wrapped from head to foot in a sheepskin recently stripped from the carcass of an animal. "'Got the dodge from an old Arctic traveller,' Goff explained. "'It's pretty greasy inside, but it keeps that perishing cold out.' "'I said I shouldn't come down to the office tonight,' Fisher muttered. "'This is the only place where I can keep decently warm. A good paper is no good to us. We shan't sell five thousand copies tomorrow.' "'Oh, yes, we shall,' Goff put in eagerly. Hampton, the member for East Battersea, is waiting for you. One of the smart city gangs has cornered the coal supply. There's about half a million tons in London, but there is no prospect of more for days to come. The whole lot was bought up yesterday by a small syndicate, and the price tomorrow is fixed at three pounds per ton to begin with. Hampton is furious. Fisher shoveled his clothes on hastily. The journalistic instinct was aroused. At his door, Fisher staggered back as the cold struck him. With two overcoats and a scarf round his head, the cold seemed to drag the life out of him. A brilliant moon was shining in a sky like steel. The air was filled with the fine frosty needles, a heavy hoar coated Goff's fleecy breast. The gardens in Russell Square were one huge mound, 
Southampton Row was one white pipe. It seemed to Gough and Fisher that they had London to themselves. They did not speak. Speech was next to impossible. Fisher staggered into his office and at length gasped for brandy. He declared that he had no feeling whatever. His moustache hung painfully as if two heavy diamonds were dragging at the ends of it. The fine athletic figure of John Hampton, M.P., raged up and down the office. Physical weakness or suffering seemed to be strangers to him. "'I want you to rub it in thick,' he shouted. "'Make a picture of it in tomorrow's chat. It's exclusive information I am giving you. Properly handled, there's enough coal in London to get over this crisis. If it isn't properly handled, then some hundreds of families are going to perish of cold and starvation. The state ought to have power to commandeer these things in a crisis like this, and sell them at a fair price, give them away if necessary. And now we have a handful of rich men who mean to profit by a great public calamity. I mean Hayes and Rise Smith and that lot. You've fallen foul of them before. I want you to call upon the poorer classes not to stand this abominable outrage. I want to go to the House of Commons tomorrow afternoon with some thousands of honest working men behind me to demand that this crime shall be stopped. No rioting, no violence, mind. The workman who buys his coals by the hundredweight will be the worst off. If I have my way, he won't suffer at all. He will just take what he wants. Fisher's eyes gleamed with the light of battle. He was warm now, and the liberal dose of brandy had done its work. Here was a good special, and a popular one to his hand. The calamity of the blizzard and the snow and the frost was bad enough, but the calamity of a failing coal supply would be hideous. Legally, there was no way of preventing those city bandits from making the most of their booty. But if a few thousand working men in London made up their minds to have coal, nothing could prevent them. "'I'll do my best!' Fisher exclaimed. I'll take my coat off to do the job, figuratively, of course. There ought to be an exciting afternoon sitting of the house tomorrow. On the whole, I'm glad that Gough dragged me out. The chat was a little late to press, but seeing that anything like a country edition was impossible, that made little difference. Fisher and Gough had made the most of their opportunity. The ears of Messrs. Hayes and Company were likely to tingle over the chat in the morning. Fisher finished at length with a sigh of satisfaction. Huddled up in his overcoat and scarf, he descended to the street. The cold struck more piercingly than ever. A belated policeman, so starved as to be almost bereft of his senses, asked for brandy, anything, to keep his frozen body and soul together. Goff, secure in his grotesque sheepskin, had already disappeared down the street. "'Come in!' Fisher gasped. It's dreadful. I was going home, but upon my word, I dare not face it. I shall sleep by the side of my office fire tonight. The man in blue slowly thawed out. His teeth chattered, his face was ghastly blue. And I'll beg a shelter too, sir, he said. I shall get kicked out of the force. I shall lose my pension. But what's the good of a pension to an officer what's picked up frozen in the strand? "'That's logic,' Fisher said sleepily. "'And as to burglars—' "'Burglars! A night like this! I wish that the streets of London were always as safe, if I might be allowed to make up the fire, sir.' But Fisher was already asleep, ranged up close alongside the fender. 4. The uneasy impression made by the chat special was soon confirmed next morning. No coal was available at the wharves under three shillings per hundredweight. Some of the poorer classes bought at the price, but the majority turned away, muttering of vengeance and deeply disappointed. Whatever way they went, the same story assailed them. The stereotyped reply was given at King's Cross, Euston, St. Pancras, and in the Caledonian Road. The situation had suddenly grown dangerous and critical. The sullen, grotesque stream flowed back westward with a headway towards Trafalgar Square. A good many sheepskins were worn, for Guff's idea had become popular. In some mysterious way it got abroad that John Hampton was going to address a mass meeting. 
By half-past two, Trafalgar Square and the approaches thereto were packed. It was a little later that Hampton appeared. There was very little cheering or enthusiasm, for it was too cold. The crowd had no disposition to riot. All they wanted was for the popular tribune to show them some way of getting coal, their one great necessity, at a reasonable price. Hampton, too, was singularly quiet and restrained. There was none of the wildness that usually accompanied his oratory. He counselled quietness and prudence. He pledged the vast gathering that before night he would show a way of getting the coal. All he required was a vast orderly crowd outside St. Stephen's, where he was going almost at once to interrogate ministers upon the present crisis. There was a question on the paper of which he had given the President of the Board of Trade private notice. If nothing came of that, he would know how to act. There was little more, but that little to the point. An hour later, a dense mass of men had gathered about St. Stephen's, but they were grim and silent and orderly. For an ordinary afternoon sitting, the house was exceedingly full. As the light fell on the square hard face of John Hampton, a prosy bore prating on some ubiquitous subject was howled down. A minute later, and Hampton rose. He put his question clearly and to the point. Then he turned and faced the modestly retiring forms of Mr. Hayes and his colleague Rise Smith, and for ten minutes they writhed under the lash of his bitter invective. As far as he could gather from the very vague reply of the Board of Trade representative, the government were powerless to act in the matter. A gang of financiers had deliberately chosen to put money in their pockets out of the great misfortune that had befallen London. Unless the new syndicate saw their way to bow to public opinion. It is a business transaction, Hayes stammered. We shall not give way. If the government likes to make a grant to the poorer classes. A yell of anger drowned the sentence. All parts of the house took part in the heated demonstration. The only two cool heads there were the speaker and John Hampton. The first lord rose to throw oil on the troubled waters. "'There is a way out of it,' he said presently. "'We can pass a short bill giving Parliament powers to acquire all fuel and provisions for the public welfare in the face of crises like this. It was done on similar lines in the dynamite bill. In two days the bill would be in the statute book.' "'And in the meantime the poorer classes will be frozen,' Hampton cried. "'The leader of the House has done his best. He will see that the bill becomes law. After tonight, the working people in London will be prepared to wait till the law gives them the power to draw their supplies without fear of punishment. But you can't punish a crowd like the one outside. I am going to show the world what a few thousands of resolute men can accomplish.' If the two honourable members opposite are curious to see how it is done, let them accompany me, and I will offer them a personal guarantee of safety. He flung his hand wide to the house. He quitted his place and strode out. Hayes rose to speak, but nobody listened. The dramatic episode was at an end, and Hampton had promised another. Within a few minutes the house was empty. Outside was the dense mass of silent, patient, shivering humanity. "'Wonderful man, Hampton,' the First Lord whispered to the President of the Board of Trade. "'Wonder what he's up to now. If those people yonder only knew their power, I should have more leisure then.'" 5. Outside the house, a great crowd of men, silent, grim, and determined, waited for Hampton. A deep murmur floated over the mass as those in front read from Hampton's face that he had failed so far as his diplomacy was concerned. His obstinate jaw was firmer, if possible. There was a gleam in his deep-set eyes. So the greedy capitalists were going to have their pound of flesh. They were not ashamed to grow fat on public misfortune. Hampton stood there by the railings of Palace Yard and explained everything in a short, curt speech. Only those who were in need of coal were present, but there would be others tomorrow and the next day, and so on. Then let them go and take it. The thing must be done in a perfectly orderly fashion. There were huge supplies at King's Cross, Euston, St. Pancras, in Caledonian Road, 
amply sufficient to give a couple or so of hundred weight per head and leave plenty over for the needs of others let them go and take it let each man insist upon leaving behind him a voucher admitting that he had taken away so much or if he had the money put it down there and then at the usual winter's rate per hundred weight the method would be of the rough rule of thumb kind but it would be a guarantee of honesty and respectability there were but few military in london and against a force like that the police would be perfectly powerless it was to be a bloodless revolution and a vindication of the rights of men a constable stepped forward and touched hampton on the shoulder most of those near at hand knew what had happened hampton had been arrested for inciting the mob to an illegal act he smiled grimly after all the law had to be respected with not the slightest sign of hostility the great mass of people began to pass away with one accord they turned their faces to the north the northwestern district was to be invaded case for bail i suppose hampton asked curtly under certain conditions sir the inspector said i shall have formally to charge you and you will have to promise to take no further part in this matter hampton promised that readily enough he had done his part of the work so that the rest did not signify he was looking tired and haggard now as well he might seeing that he had been sitting up all night with some scores of labor representatives planning this thing out he made a remark about it to fisher who was standing by mentally photographing the great event then he fastened upon hampton eagerly i want all the details he said i wasn't so foolish as to regard this thing as quite spontaneous you must have worked like a horse so we have hampton admitted fact is perils that might beset londoners have long been a favourite speculative study of mine and when a thing like this be it famine flood or an arctic winter comes we are certain to be the mark of the greedy capitalist and i knew that the government would be powerless fuel or the want of it was one of the very early ideas that occurred to me i found out where the big supplies were kept and pretty well what the normal stock is i pigeonholed those figures you can imagine how useful they were last night there are some two hundred officials of trades unions with yonder orderly mob and every one of them knows exactly where to go there will be very little crowding or rioting or confusion and before dark everybody will have his coal fisher followed with the deepest interest then you are going to leave the rest to your lieutenants he asked i'm bound to in a few minutes i shall be on my way to bow street inciting to robbery you know no there is no occasion to trouble a hundred men here will be willing to go bail for me if i were you i should have been somewhere in the neighbourhood of king's cross by this time fisher nodded and winked as he drew his sheepskin about him he wore a pair of grotesque old cavalry boots the tops of which were stuffed with cotton wool a large woollen hood such as old highland women wear covered his head and ears there were many legislators similarly attired but nobody laughed and nobody seemed to be in the least alive to the humours of the situation come along fisher said to gough who was trying to warm the end of his nose with a large cigar seems a pity to waste all this album of copy upon a paper without any circulation what would have a circulation in this frost gough growled how deserted the place is seems shuddering to think that a man might fall down in trafalgar square in the broad daylight and die of exposure but there it is hang me if the solitude isn't getting on my nerves gough shivered as he pulled his sheepskin closer around him this is getting a nightmare he said we shall find ourselves dodging polar bears presently it isn't gregarious enough for me let's get along in the direction where hampton's friends are six meanwhile the vast mob of london's workers was steadily pressing north there were hundreds of carts without wheels which necessarily hampered the rate of progression but would save time in the long run for there were any number up to a dozen with each conveyance seeing that various neighbours were working upon the cooperation system gradually the force began to break and turn in certain directions 
It became like an army, marching upon given points by a score or more of avenues. It was pretty well known that there were a couple of hundred men among the multitude who knew exactly where to go and who had instructions as to certain grimy goals. They were breaking away in all directions now, quiet, steady, and determined, covering a wide area from Caledonian Road to Euston, and from Finsbury Park to King's Cross. They were so quiet and orderly that only the crunch of the snow and the sound of heavy breathing could be heard. Near Euston Station the first sign of resistance was encountered. A force of eighty police barred the way. The mob closed in. There was no hot blood, no more than grim determination with a dash of sardonic humour in it. A head or two was broken by the thrashing staves. But the odds were too great. In five minutes the whole posse of constables was disarmed, made secure by their own handcuffs, and taken along as honoured prisoners of war. Perhaps their sympathies were with the mob, for they made nothing like so fine a fight of it as is usually the case. Up by King's Cross Station a still larger force of police had massed, and here there was some considerable amount of bloodshed. But there were thousands of men within easy distance of the fray, and the white silence of the place became black with swaying figures and the noise of turmoil carried far. Finally the police were beaten back, squeezed in between two vastly superior forces, and surrendered at discretion. The victory was easier than it seemed, for obviously the constables had no heart for the work before them. Not a few of them were thinking of their own firesides, and that they would be better off in the ranks of their antagonists. Meanwhile many of the local municipalities were being urged to call out the military. With one accord they declined to do anything of the kind. It was the psychological moment when one touch of nature makes the whole world akin. In the House of Commons, to the agonized appeal of Hayes and his partner, the Secretary for War coldly preferred to be unable to interfere unless the mayor of this or that borough applied for assistance after reading the Riot Act. The matter was in the hands of the police, who would know how to act upon an emergency. Hustled and bustled and pushed good-naturedly, Fisher and his colleague found themselves at length beyond a pair of huge gates that opened into a yard just beyond Euston Station. There was a large square area, and beyond three small mountains of coal, all carefully stacked in the usual way. Before the welcome sight the stolid demeanour of the two thousand men who had raided the yard fairly broke down. They threw up their hands and laughed and cheered. They stormed the office of the big coal company, who were ostensible owners of all that black wealth, and dragged the clerks into the yard. From behind came the crash and rattle of the wheelless carts as they were dragged forward. "'No cause to be frightened,' the man in command explained. "'We're here to buy that coal, one or two or three hundred weight each, as the case may be, and you can have your money in cash or vouchers, as you please. But we're going to have the stuff, and don't forget it. You just stand by the gates and check us out. You'll have to guess a bit, but that won't be any loss to you. And the price is eighteen pence a hundredweight. The three clerks grinned uneasily. At the same moment the same strange scene was being enacted in over a hundred other coal yards. Three or four hundred men were already swarming over the big mound. There was a crash and a rattle as the huge blocks fell. The air was filled with a grimy, gritty black powder. Every face was soon black with it. Very soon there was a steady stream away from the radius of the coal stacks. A big stream of coal carts went crunching over the hard, frozen snow, pulled by one or two or three men according to the load, or how many had cooperated, and as they went along they sang and shouted in their victory. It was disorderly, it was wrong, it was a direct violation of the law. But man makes laws for man. Goff and Fisher, passing down parallel with Euston Road, presently found themselves suddenly in the thick of an excited mob. The doors of a wharf had been smashed in, but in the centre of the yard stood a resolute knot of men who had affixed a hose-pipe to one of the water mains and defied the marauders with vigorous invective. Just for a moment there was a pause. 
The idea of being drenched from head to foot with a thermometer verging upon zero was appalling. These men would have faced fire, but the other death, for death it would mean, was terrible. "'Does that chap want to get murdered?' Fisher exclaimed. "'If he does that, they will tear him to pieces. I say, sir, are you mad?' He pressed forward impulsively. Mistaking his intention, the man with the hose-pipe turned on the cock vigorously. A howl of rage followed, but the dramatic touch was absent. Not one spot of water came. A sudden yell of laughter arose in time to save the life of the amateur fireman. "'The water is frozen in the mains!' a voice cried. It was even as the voice said. In a flash everything became commonplace again. Fisher was very grave as he walked away. "'This is a calamity in itself,' he said. "'The water frozen in the mains. By this time to-morrow there won't be a single drop available.'" 7. Inside the house a hot debate was in progress on the following day. Martial law for London had been suggested. It was a chance for the handful of cranks and fattists not to be neglected. It was an interference with the liberty of the subject and all the rest of it. The debate was still on at ten o'clock when Fisher came back languidly to the press gallery. At eleven one of the champion bores was still speaking. Suddenly an electric thrill ran through the house. The dreary orator paused. Perhaps he was getting a little tired of himself. Something dramatic had happened. There was the curious tense atmosphere that caused a tightening of the chest and a gripping of the throat before actual knowledge comes. Heedless of all decorum, a member stood behind the speaker's chair and called out, "'The Hotel Cecil is on fire!' he yelled. "'The place is well ablaze!' Fisher darted from the gallery into the yard. Even the prosy Demosthenes collapsed in the midst of his oration and hurried out of the house. There was no occasion to tell anybody what the magnitude of the disaster meant. Everybody knew that in the face of such a disaster the fire brigade would be useless. In the Strand and along the approaches thereto, along the embankment and upon the bridges, a dense mass of humanity had gathered. They were muffled in all sorts of strange and grotesque garments, but they did not seem to heed the piercing cold. In the Strand it was as light as day. A huge column of red and white flame shot far into the sky. The steady roar of the blaze was like a surf on a stony beach. There was a constant crackle like musketry fire. The magnificent hotel, one of the boldest and most prominent features of the Strand and the Thames Embankment, was absolutely doomed. Now and then the great showers of falling sparks would flutter and catch some adjacent woodwork, but all the roofs around were covered with firemen who beat out the flames at once. Tons of snow were conveyed up the fire escapes, and by means of hastily rigged up pulleys, so that gradually the adjacent buildings became moist and cool. But for this merciful presence of the snow, the south side of the Strand, from Wellington Street to Charing Cross, might have passed into history. As it was now, unless something utterly unforeseen occurred, the great calamity had been averted. There was still much for the firemen to do. "'Let's get back to the office,' Fisher said, with chattering teeth. "'I would sell my kingdom for a little hot brandy. I hope the next blizzard we get we shall be more prepared for. I suppose that out in the States they would make nothing of this and we haven't got a single snow-plow worthy of the name this side of Edinburgh. We are ready for nothing, Gough grumbled. If there had been a wind to-night, nothing could have saved the Strand. The disaster may occur again. Indeed, there is certain to be a fire, half a dozen fires, before daybreak. Given a good stiff breeze, and where would London be? It makes one giddy to think of it. Gough said nothing. It was too cold even to think. Gradually the two of them thawed out before the office fire. A languid sub came in with a pile of flimsies. Quite as languidly Gough turned them over. His eyes gleamed. "'My word!' he gasped. "'I hope this is true. They've had two days' deluge in New York. We are to keep our eyes open for strong westerly gales with a deep depression.' 
For the next two hours Fisher bent over his desk. The room seemed warmer. Perhaps it was the brandy. He took off his sheepskin, and then his overcoat below. Presently a little bead of moisture grew on his forehead. He drew a little further from the fire. He felt stifling and faint. A desire for air came over him. A little doubtful of his own condition, he almost shamefacedly opened the window. The air was cold and fresh and revived him, but it was not the steely, polished, murderous air of the last few days. Somebody passing over the snow below slipped along with a peculiar soaking, sodden sound. Fisher craned his head out of the window. Something moist fell on the nape of his neck. He yelled for Goff almost hysterically. Goff also was devoid of his overcoat. "'I thought it was fancy,' he said unsteadily. Fisher answered nothing. The strain was released. He breathed freely. And outside, the whole white, silent world was dripping, dripping, dripping. End of story one. Story two of The Doom of London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Story two The Four Days Night. The story of a London fog that turned daylight into darkness for four days. One. The weather forecast for London and the Channel was light airs, fine generally, milder. Further down the fascinating column, Hackness read that the conditions over Europe generally favoured a continuance of the large anticyclonic area, the barometer steadily rising over Western Europe, sea smooth, readings being unusually high for this time of the year. Martin Hackness, Bachelor of Science, London, thoughtfully read all this and more. The study of the meteorological reports was part of his religion almost. In the laboratory at the back of his sitting-room were all kinds of weird-looking instruments for measuring sunshine and wind pressure, the weight of atmosphere and the like. Hackness trusted before long to be able to foretell a London fog with absolute accuracy, which, when you come to think of it, would be an exceedingly useful matter. In his queer way Hackness described himself as a fog specialist. He hoped some day to prove himself a fog disperser which is another word for a great public benefactor. The chance he was waiting for seemed to have come at last. November had set in, mild and dull and heavy. Already there had been one or two of the dense fogs under which London periodically groans and does nothing to avert. Hackness was clear-sighted enough to see a danger here that might some day prove a hideous national disaster. So far as he could ascertain from his observations and readings, London was in for another dense fog within the next four and twenty hours. Unless he was greatly mistaken, the next fog was going to be a particularly thick one. He could see the yellow mists gathering in Gower Street as he sat at his breakfast. The door flew open, and a man rushed in without even an apology. He was a little man, with sharp, clean-shaven features, an interrogative nose and assertive pince-nez. He was not unlike Hackness, minus his calm ruminative manner. He fluttered a paper in his hand like a banner. "'It's come, Hackness,' he cried. "'It was bound to come some time. It's all here in a late edition of the Telegraph. We must go and see it.' He flung himself into an armchair. "'Do you remember,' he said, "'the day in the winter of 1898, the day that petroleum ship exploded?' You and I were playing golf together on the Westgate links. Hackness nodded eagerly. I shall never forget it, Eldred, he said, though I have forgotten the name of the ship. She was a big iron boat, and she caught fire about daybreak. Of her captain and her crew, not one fragment was ever found. It was perfectly still, and the effect of that immense volume of dense black smoke was marvellous. Do you recollect the scene at sunset? It was like looking at a half-dozen alpine ranges piled one on top of the other. The spectacle was not only grand, it was appalling, awful. 
Do you happen to recall what you said at the time? There was something in Eldred's manner that roused Hackness. Perfectly well, he cried. I pictured that awful canopy of sooty, fatty matter suddenly shut down over a great city by a fog. A fog would have beaten it down and spread it. We tried to imagine what might happen if that ship had been in the Thames, say at Greenwich. Didn't you prophesy a big fog for today? Certainly I did, and a recent examination of my instruments merely confirms my opinion. Why do you ask? Because early this morning a fire broke out in the great petroleum storage tanks, down the river. Millions of gallons of oil are bound to burn themselves out. Nothing short of a miracle can quench the fire, which will probably rage all through today and tomorrow. The fire brigades are absolutely powerless. In the first place, the heat is too awful to allow them to approach. In the second, water would only make things worse. It's one of the biggest blazes ever known. Pray heaven your fog doesn't settle down on top of the smoke. Hackness turned away from his unfinished breakfast and struggled into an overcoat. There was a peril here that London little dreamt of. Out in the yellow streets, newsboys were yelling of the conflagration down the Thames. People were talking of the disaster in a calm frame of mind, between the discussion of closer personal matters. "'There's always the chance of a breeze springing up,' Hackness muttered. "'If it does, well and good. If not... But come along. We'll train it from Charing Cross.' A little way down the river the mist curtain lifted. A round magnified sun looked down upon a dun earth. Towards the southeast a great black column rose high in the sky. The column appeared to be absolutely motionless. It broadened from an inky base like a grotesque mushroom. "'Fancy trying to breathe that,' Eldred muttered. "'Just think of the poison there. I wonder what that dense mass would weigh in tons. And it's been going on for five hours now. There's enough there to suffocate all London." Hackness made no reply. On the whole he was wishing himself well out of it. That pillar of smoke would rise for many more hours yet. At the same time, here was his great opportunity. There were certain experiments that he desired to make, and for which all things were ready. They reached the scene of the catastrophe. Within a radius of five hundred yards the heat was intense. Nobody seemed to know the cause of the disaster, beyond the general opinion that the oil gases had ignited. And nothing could be done. No engine could approach near enough to do any good. Those mighty tanks and barrels filled with petroleum would have to burn themselves out. The sheets of flame roared and sobbed. Above the flames rose the column of thick black smoke, with just the suspicion of a slight stagger to the westward. The inky vapour spread overhead like a pall. If Hackness's fog came now, it meant a terrible disaster for London. Further out in the country, where the sun was actually shining, people watched that great cloud with fearsome admiration. From a few miles beyond the radius, it looked as if all the ranges of the world had been piled atop of London. The fog was gradually spreading along the south of the Thames, and away as far as Barnet to the north. There was something in the stillness and the gloom that London did not associate with ordinary fogs. Hackness turned away at length, conscious of the sketchy breakfast and the fact that he had been watching this thrilling spectacle for two hours. "'Have you thought of a way out?' Eldred asked. "'What are you going to do?' "'Lunch,' Hackness said curtly. "'After that I propose to see to my arrangements in Regent's Park.' I've got Grimfern's aeroplane there, and a pretty theory about high explosives. The difficulty is to get the authorities to consent to the experiments. The police have absolutely forbidden experiments with high explosives fired in the air above London. But perhaps I shall frighten them into it this time. Nothing would please me better than to see a breeze spring up, and yet, on the other hand— Then you are free tonight? Eldred asked. No, I'm not. Oh, there will be plenty of time. I'm going with Sir Edgar Grimfern and his daughter to see Irving. That is, if it's possible for anyone to see Irving tonight. I've got the chance of a lifetime at hand, but I wish it was well over, Eldred, my boy. If you come round about midnight... 
I'll be sure to, Eldred said eagerly. I'm going to be in this thing, and I want to know all about that explosive idea. 2. Martin Hackness dressed with less than his usual care that evening. He even forgot that Miss Cynthia Grimfern had a strong prejudice in favour of black evening ties, and, usually, he paid a great deal of deference to her opinions. But he was thinking of other matters now. There was no sign of anything abnormal as Hackness drove along in the direction of Clarence Terrace. The night was more than typically yellow for the time of year, but there was no kind of trouble with the traffic, though down the river the fairway lay under a dense bank of cloud. Hackness sniffed the air eagerly. He detected, or thought he detected, a certain acrid suggestion in the atmosphere. As the cab approached Trafalgar Square, Hackness could hear shouts and voices raised high in protestation. Suddenly his cab seemed to be plunged into a wall of darkness. It was so swift and unexpected that it came with the force of a blow. The horse appeared to have trotted into a bank of dense blackness. The wall had shut down so swiftly, blotting out a section of London, that Hackness could only gaze at it with mouth wide open. Hackness hopped out of his cab hurriedly. So sheer and stark was the black wall that the horse was out of sight. Mechanically the driver reined back. The horse came back to the cab with the dazzling swiftness of a conjuring trick. A thin stream of breeze wandered from the direction of Whitehall. It was this air finding its way up the funnel formed by the sheet that cut off the fog to a razor edge. "'Been teetotal for eighteen years,' the cabman muttered. "'So that's all right. And what do you please to make of it, sir?' Hackness muttered something incoherent. As he stood there, the black wall lifted like a stage curtain, and he found himself under the lee of an omnibus. In a dazed kind of way, he patted the cab horse on the flank. He looked at his hand. It was greasy and oily and grimy, as if he had been caught in the engine room of a big liner. "'Get on as fast as you can,' he cried. "'It was fog, just a little present from the burning petroleum. Anyway, it's gone now.' True, the black curtain had lifted, but the atmosphere reeked with the odour of burning oil. The lamps in the shop windows were splashed and mottled with something that might have passed for black snow. Traffic had been brought to a standstill for the moment. Eager knots of pedestrians were discussing the situation with alarm and agitation. A man in evening dress was busily engaged in a vain attempt to remove sundry black patches from his shirt-front. Sir Edgar Grimfern was glad to see his young friend. Had Grimfern been comparatively poor, and less addicted to big-game shooting, he would doubtless have proved a great scientific light. Anything with a dash of adventure fascinated him. He was enthusiastic on flying machines and aeroplanes generally. There were big workshops at the back of 119, Clarence Terrace, where Hackness put in a good deal of his spare time. Those two were going to startle the world presently. Hackness shook hands thoughtfully with Cynthia Grimfern. There was a slight frown on her pretty intellectual face as she noted his tie. "'There's a large smut on it,' she remarked, "'and it serves you right.' Hackness explained. He had a flattering audience. He told of the strange happening in Trafalgar Square, and the majestic scene on the river. He gave a graphic account of the theory that he had built upon it. There was an animated discussion all through dinner. "'The moral of which is that we are going to be plunged into Cimmerian darkness,' Cynthia said. "'That is, if the fog comes down. If you think you are going to frighten me out of my evening's entertainment, you are mistaken.' All the same, it had grown much darker and thicker, as the trio drove off in the direction of the Lyceum Theatre. There were patches of dark acrid fog here and there, like ropes of smoke into which figures passed and disappeared, only to come out on the other side choking and coughing. So local were these swaths of fog that in a wide thoroughfare it was possible to partially avoid them. Festoons of vapour hung from one lamp post to another. The air was filled with a fatty, sickening odour. "'How nasty!' Cynthia exclaimed. Mr. Hackness, please close that window. 
I am almost sorry that we started. What's that? There was a shuffling movement under the seat of the carriage, the quick bark of a dog. Cynthia's little fox terrier had stolen into the brougham. It was a favourite trick of his, the girl explained. He'll go back again, she said. Kim knows that he has done wrong. That Kim was forgotten, and discovered later on coiled up under the stall of his mistress, was a mere detail. Hackness was too preoccupied to feel any uneasiness. He was only conscious that the electric lights were growing dim and yellow, and that a brown haze was coming between the auditorium and the stage. When the curtain fell on the third act, it was hardly possible to see across the theatre. Two or three large heavy blots of some greasy matter fell on to the white shoulders of a lady in the stalls, to be hastily wiped away by her companion. They left a long greasy smear behind. "'I can hardly breathe!' Cynthia gasped. I wish I had stopped at home. Surely those electric lights are going out. But the lights were merely being wrapped in a filament that every moment grew more and more dense. As the curtain went up again, there was just the suspicion of a draught from the back of the stage, and the whole of it was smothered in a small brown cloud that left absolutely nothing to the view. It was impossible now to make out a single word of the programme, even when it was held close to the eyes. "'Hackness was right,' Grimfern growled. "'We had far better have stayed at home.' Hackness said nothing. He had no pride in the accuracy of his forecast. Perhaps he was the only man in London who knew what the full force of this catastrophe meant. It grew so dark now that he could see no more than the mere faint suggestion of his fair companion. Something was falling out of the gloom like black, ragged snow. As the pall lifted just for an instant, he could see the dainty dresses of the women absolutely smothered with the thick, oily smuts. The reek of petroleum was stifling. There was a frightened scream from behind, and a yell out of the ebony wall to the effect that somebody had fainted. Someone was speaking from the stage with a view to stay what might prove to be a dangerous panic. Another sombre wave filled the theatre, and then it grew absolutely black, so black that a match held a foot or so from the nose could not be seen. One of the plagues of Egypt, with all its horrors, had fallen upon London. "'Let us try and make our way out,' Hackness suggested. "'Go quietly.' Others seemed to be moved by the same idea. It was too black and dark for anything like a rush so that a dangerous panic was out of the question. Slowly but surely the fashion audience reached the vestibule, the hall, and the steps. Nothing to be seen, no glimmer of anything, no sound of traffic. The destroying angel might have passed over London, and blotted out all human life. The magnitude of the disaster had frightened London's millions as it fell. 3. A city of the blind, six millions of people suddenly deprived of sight. The disaster sounds impossible, a nightmare, the wild vaporings of a diseased imagination. And yet, why not? Given a favourable atmospheric condition, something colossal in the way of a fire, and there it is. And there, somewhere, folded away in the books of nature, is the simple remedy. Such thoughts as these flashed through Hackness's mind, as he stood under the portico of the Lyceum Theatre, quite helpless and inert for the moment. But the darkness was thicker and blacker than anything he had ever imagined. It was absolutely the darkness that could be felt. Hackness could hear the faint scratching of matches all around him, but there was no glimmer of light anywhere. And the atmosphere was thick, stifling, greasy. Yet it was not quite as stifling as fervid imagination suggested. The very darkness suggested suffocation. Still there was air, a sultry light breeze that set the murk in motion, and mercifully brought from some purer area the oxygen that made life possible. There was always air, thank God, to the end of the four days' night. Nobody spoke for a time. Not a sound of any kind could be heard. It was odd to think that a few miles away the country might be sleeping under the clear stars. 
it was terrible to think that hundreds of thousands of people must be standing lost in the streets and yet near to home a little way off a dog whined a child in a sweet refined voice cried that she was lost an anxious mother called in reply the little one had been forgotten in the first flood of that awful darkness by sheer good luck hackness was enabled to locate the child he could feel that her wraps were rich and costly though the same fatty slime was upon them he caught the child up in his arms and yelled that he had got her the mother was close by yet full five minutes elapsed before hackness blundered upon her something was whining and fawning about his feet he called upon Grimfern, and the latter answered in his ear. Cynthia was crying pitifully and helplessly. Some women were past that. "'For heaven's sake, tell us what we are to do,' Grimfern gasped. "'I flatter myself that I know London well, but I couldn't find my home in this.' Something was licking Hackness's hand. It was the dog, Kim. There was just a chance here. He tore his handkerchief in strips and knotted it together. One end he fastened to the little dog's collar. "'It's Kim,' he explained. "'Tell the dog, home. There's just a chance that he may lead you home. We're very wonderful creatures, but one sensible dog is worth a million of us tonight. Try it.' "'And where are you going?' Cynthia asked. She spoke high, for a babble of voices had broken out. "'What will become of you?' "'Oh, I am all right,' Hackness said, with an affected cheerfulness. "'You see, I was fairly sure that this would happen sooner or later, so I pigeonholed a way of dealing with the difficulty. Scotland Yard listened, but thought me a bore all the same. This is the situation where I come in.' Grimfern touched the dog and urged him forward. Kim gave a little bark and a whine. His muscular little body strained at the leash. "'It's all right,' Grimfern cried. "'Kim understands. That queer little pill-box of a brain of his is worth the finest intellect in England to-night.' Cynthia whispered a faint good-night, and Hackness was alone. As he stood there in the blackness the sense of suffocation was overwhelming. He essayed to smoke a cigarette, but he hadn't the remotest idea whether the thing was a light or not. It had no taste or flavour but it was idle to stand there. He must fight his way along to Scotland Yard to persuade the authorities to listen to his ideas. There was not the slightest danger of belated traffic. No sane man would have driven a horse in such dense night. Hackness blundered along without the faintest idea to which point of the compass he was facing. If he could only get his bearings he felt that he should be all right. He found his way into the Strand at length. He fumbled up against someone and asked where he was. A hoarse voice responded that the owner fancied it was somewhere in Piccadilly. There were scores of people in the streets, standing about, talking desperately, absolute strangers clinging to one another for sheer craving for company to keep the frayed senses together. The most fastidious clubman there would have chummed with the toughest hooligan rather than have his own thoughts for company. Hackness pushed his way along. If he got out of his bearings, he adopted the simple experiment of knocking at the first door he came to, and asking where he was. His reception was not invariably enthusiastic, but it was no time for nice distinctions. Fear bore everybody down. At last he came to Scotland Yard, as the clocks proclaimed that it was half-past one. Ghostly official voices told Hackness the way to Inspector Williamson's office. Stern officials grasped him by the arm and piloted him up flights of stairs. He blundered over a chair and sat down. Out of the black cavern of space Inspector Williamson spoke. "'I'm thankful you have come. You are just the man I most wanted to see. I want my memory refreshed over that scheme of yours,' he said. "'I didn't pay very much attention to it at the time.' "'Of course you didn't. Did you ever know an original prophet who wasn't laughed at? Still, I don't mind confessing that I had hardly anticipated anything quite so awful as this. The very density of it makes some parts of my scheme impossible. We shall have to shut our teeth and endure it. Nothing really practical can be done so long as this fog lasts.' 
But, man alive, how long will it last? Perhaps an hour, or perhaps a week. Do you grasp what an awful calamity faces us? Williamson had no reply. So long as the fog lasted, London was in a state of siege, and, not only this, but every house in it was a fort, each depending upon itself for supplies. No bread could be baked, no meal could be carried round, no milk or vegetables delivered, so long as the fog remained. Given a day or two of this, and thousands of families would be on the verge of starvation. It was not a pretty picture that Hackness drew, but Williamson was bound to agree with every word of it. These two men sat in the darkness till what should have been the dawn, while scores of subordinates were setting some sort of machinery in motion to preserve order. Hackness stumbled home to his rooms about nine o'clock in the morning, without having succeeded in persuading the officials to grant him permission to experiment. Mechanically he felt for his watch to see the time. The watch was gone. Hackness smiled grimly. The predatory classes had not been quite blind to the advantages of the situation. There was no breakfast for Hackness for the simple reason that it had been found impossible to light the kitchen fire. But there was a loaf of bread, some cheese, and a knife. Hackness fumbled for his bottled beer and a glass. There were many worse breakfasts in London that morning. He woke presently, conscious that a clock was striking nine. After some elaborate thought and the asking of a question or two from another inmate of the house, Hackness found to his horror that he had slept the clock round nearly twice. It was nine o'clock in the morning, twenty-three hours since he had fallen asleep. And, so far as Hackness could judge, there were no signs of the fog's abatement. He changed his clothes and washed the greasy slime off him so far as cold water and soap would allow. There were plenty of people in the streets, hunting for food for the most part. There were tales of people found dead in the gutters. Progression was slow, but the utter absence of traffic rendered it safe and possible. Men spoke with bated breath, the weight of the great calamity upon them. News came from a few miles outside the radius, and spoke of clear skies and bright sunshine. There was a great deal of sickness, and the doctors had more than they could manage, especially with the young and the delicate. And the calamity looked like getting worse. Six million people were breathing what oxygen there was. Hackness returned to his chambers to find Eldred awaiting him. "'This can't go on, you know,' the latter said tersely. "'Of course it can't,' Hackness replied. "'All the air is getting exhausted. Come with me down to Scotland Yard and help to try and persuade Williamson to test my experiment.' "'What? Do you mean to say he is still obstinate?' Well, perhaps he feels different today. Come along. Williamson was in a chastened frame of mind. He had no optimistic words when Hackness suggested that nothing less than a violent meteorological disturbance would clear the deadly peril of the fog away. It was time for drastic remedies, and if they failed, things would be no worse than before. But can you manage it? Williamson asked. I fancy so, Hackness replied. It's a risk, of course, but everything has been ready for a long time. We could start after tomorrow midnight, or any time for that matter. Very well, Williamson sighed, with the air of a man who realizes that after all the tooth must come out. If this produces a calamity, I shall be asked to send in my resignation. If I refuse... If you refuse, there is more than a chance that you won't want another situation. Hackness said grimly. Let's get the thing going, Eldred. They crawled along through the black suffocating darkness, feeble, languid, and sweating at every pore. There was a murky closeness in the vitiated atmosphere that seemed to take all the strength and energy away. At any other time the walk to Clarence Terrace would have been a pleasure. Now it was a penance. They found their objective after a deal of patience and trouble. Hackness yelled in the doorway. There was a sound of footsteps, and Cynthia Grimfern spoke. "'Ah, what a relief it is to know that you are all right,' she said. "'I pictured all sorts of horrors happening to you. Will this never end, Martin?' She cried softly in her distress. 
Hackness felt for her hand and pressed it tenderly. "'We are going to try my great theory,' he said. "'Eldred is with me, and we have Williamson's permission to operate with the aeroplane. Where is Sir Edgar?' Grimfern was in the big workshop in the garden. As best he could, he was fumbling over some machinery for the increase of power in electric lighting. Hackness took a queer-looking lamp with double reflectors from his pocket. "'Shut off that dynamo,' he said, and give me the flex. I've got a little idea here Bramley, the electrician, lent me. With that thousand-volt generator of yours I can get a light equal to forty thousand candles. There!' Flick went the switch, and the others staggered back with their hands to their eyes. The great volume of light, impossible to face under ordinary circumstances, illuminated the workshop with a faint glow, like a winter's dawn. It was sufficient for all practical purpose, but to eyes that had seen absolutely nothing for two days and nights, very painful. Cynthia laughed hysterically. She saw the men grimed and dirty, blackened and greasy, as if they were fresh from a stoker's hole in a tropical sea. They saw a tall, graceful girl in the droll parody of a kitchen-maid, who had wiped a tearful face with a black-lead brush. But they could see. Along the whole floor of the workshop lay a queer cigar-shaped instrument with grotesque wings and a tail like that of a fish, but capable of being turned in any direction. It seemed a problem to get this strange-looking monster out of the place, but as the whole of the end of the workshop was constructed to pull out, the difficulty was not great. This was Sir Edgar Grimfern's aeroplane, built under his own eyes and with the assistance of Hackness and Eldred. "'It will be a bit of a risk in the dark,' Sir Edgar said thoughtfully. "'It will, sir, but I hope it will mean the saving of a great city,' Hackness remarked. "'We shall have no difficulty in getting up, and as to the getting down, don't forget that the atmosphere a few miles beyond the outskirts of London is quite clear. If only the explosives are strong enough.' "'Don't theorize,' Eldred snapped. "'We've got a good day's work before we start, and there is no time to be lost.' "'Luncheon first, Sir Edgar suggested. "'Served in here. It will be plain and cold, but, thank goodness, there is plenty of it. My word, after that awful darkness, what a blessed thing light is once more!' Two hours after midnight the doors of the workshop were pulled away and the aeroplane was dragged on its carriage into the garden. The faint glimmer of light only served to make the blackness all the thicker. The three men waved their hands silently to Cynthia, and jumped in. A few seconds later, and they were whirred and screwed away into the suffocating fog. 4. London was holding out doggedly and stolidly. Scores of houses watched and waited for missing ones who would never return. The streets and the river had taken their toll. In open spaces, in the parks, and on the heaths, many were shrouded. But the long black night held its secret well. There had been some ruffianism and plundering at first, but what was the use of plunder to the thief who could not dispose of his booty, who could not exchange a rare diamond for so much as a mouthful of bread? Some of them could not even find their way home. They had to remain in the streets where there was the dread of the lifting blanket and the certainty of punishment with the coming of the day. But if certain houses mourned the loss of inmates, some had more than their share. Belated women, frightened business girls, caught in the fog, had sought the first haven at hand, and there they were free to remain. There were seamstresses in Mayfair, and delicately nurtured ladies in obscure Bloomsbury boarding-houses. Class distinction seemed to be remote as the Middle Ages. Scotland Yard, the local authorities, and the county council had worked splendidly together. Provisions were short, though a good deal of bread and milk had, with greatest difficulty, been imported from outside the radius of the scourge. Still, the poor were suffering acutely and the cries of frightened children were heard in every street. A few days more, and the stoutest nerves must give way. Nobody could face such a blackness and retain their senses for long. London was a city of the blind. Sleep was the only panacea for the creeping madness. 
there were few deeds of violence done the most courageous the most bloodthirsty man grew mild and gentle before the scourge desperate men prowled about in search of food but they wanted nothing else certainly they would not have attempted violence to get it alarmists predicted that in a few hours life in london would be impossible for once they had reason on their side every hour the air or what passed for air grew more poisonous men fancied a city with six million corpses the calamity would kill big cities altogether no great mass of people would ever dare to congregate together again where manufacturers made a hideous atmosphere overhead it would be a great check upon the race for gold there was much justification for this morbid condition of public feeling so the third long weary day dragged to an end and people went to bed in the old mechanical fashion hoping for better signs in the morning how many weary years since they had last seen the sunshine colour anything there was a change from the black monotony some time after dawn most people had nearly lost all sense of time when dawn ought to have been people were struggling back to their senses again trying to pierce the thick curtain that held everything in bondage doors were opened and restless ones passed into the street suddenly there was a smiting shock from somewhere a deafening splitting roar in the ears and central london shivered it was as if some mighty explosion had taken place in space and as if the same concussion had been followed by a severe shock of earthquake huge buildings shook and trembled furniture was overturned and from every house came the smash of glass was this merely a fog or some thick curtain that veiled the approaching dissolution of the world people stood still trembling and wondering and before the question was answered a strange thing a modern miracle happened a great arc of the blackness peeled off and stripped the daylight bare before their startled eyes five the work was full of a real live peril but the aeroplane was cast loose at length its upward motion was slow perhaps owing to the denseness of the atmosphere for some time nobody spoke something seemed to oppress their breathing they were barely conscious of the faint upward motion if they only rose perfectly straight all would be well that's a fine light you had in the workshop said eldred but why not have established a few hundreds of them all over london hackness cut in for simple reason that the lamp my friend lent me is the only one in existence it is worked at a dangerous voltage too the upward motion continued the sails of the aeroplane rustled slightly grimfern drew a deep breath air he gasped real pure fresh air do you notice it the cool sweetness of it filled their lungs the sudden effect of it was almost intoxicating a wild desire to laugh and shout and sing came over them then gradually three human faces and a ghostly shaped aeroplane emerged out of nothingness they could see one another plainly now they felt the upward rush they were passing through a misty envelope that twisted and curled like live ropes another minute and they were beyond the fog belt they looked at one another and laughed all three of them were blackened and grimed and greasy smothered from head to foot in fatty soot flakes three more disreputable looking ruffians it would have been hard to imagine there was something grotesque in the reflection that every londoner was the same it was light now broad daylight with a round globe of sun climbing up out of the pearly mists in the east they revelled in the brightness and the light below them lay the thick layers of fog that would be a shroud in earnest if nothing came to dispel it we're a thousand feet above the city eldred said presently we had better pay out five hundred feet of cable to a hook at the end of a flexible wire hackness attached a large bomb filled with a certain high explosive through the eye of the hook another wire an electric one was attached the whole thing was carefully lowered to the full extent of the cable two anxious faces peered from the car grimfern appeared to be playing carelessly with a polished switch spliced into the wire but his hands were shaking 
Eldred nodded. He had no words to spare just then. Grimfern's forefinger pressed the polished button. There was a snap, and almost immediately a roar and a rush of air that set the aeroplane rocking violently. All about them the clouds were spinning. Below, the foggy envelope was twisted and torn, as smoke is blown away from a huge stack by a high wind. "'Look!' Hackness yelled. "'Look at that!' He pointed downwards. The force of the explosion had literally torn a hole in the dense foggy curtain. The brilliant light of day shone through down into London as from a gigantic skylight. This is what the amazed inhabitants of central London saw as they rushed out of their houses after what they imagined to be a shock of earthquake. The effect was weird, wonderful, one never to be forgotten. From a radius of half a mile from St. Paul's, London was flooded with brilliant light. People rubbed their eyes, unable to face the sudden and blinding glare. They gasped and thrilled with exultation as a column of fresh sweet air rushed to fill the vacuum. As yet they knew nothing of the cause. That brilliant shaft of light showed strange things. Every pavement was black as ink. The fronts of the houses looked as if they had been daubed over with pitch. The roads were dark with fatty soot. On Ludgate Hill were dozens of vehicles from which the horses had been detached. There were numerous motor-cars apparently lacking owners. A pickpocket sat in the gutter with a pile of costly trinkets about him, gems that glittered in the mud. These things had been collected before the fog grew beyond endurance. Now they were about as useful to the thief as an elephant might have been. At the end of five minutes the curtain fell again. The flying, panic-stricken pickpocket huddled down once more with a frightened curse. But London was no longer alarmed. A passing glimpse of the aeroplane had been seen, and better informed folks knew what was taking place. Presently another explosion followed, tearing the curtain away over Hampstead. For the next two hours the explosions continued at short intervals. There were tremendous outbursts of cheering whenever the relief came. Presently a little light seemed to be coming. Ever and again it was possible for a man to see his hands before his face. Above the fog banks a rack of cloud had gathered. The aeroplane was coated with a glittering mist. An hour before it had been perfectly fair overhead. Then it began to rain in earnest. The constant explosions had summoned up and brought down the rain as the heavy discharge of artillery used to do in the days of the Boer War. It came down in a drenching stream that wetted the occupants of the aeroplane to the skin. They did not seem to mind. The exhilaration of the fresh sweet air was still in their veins. They worked on at their bombs till the last ounce of the high explosives was exhausted. And the rain was falling over London. Wherever a hole was torn in the curtain, the rain was seen to fall. Black rain, as thick as ink and quite as disfiguring. The whole city wore a suit of mourning. "'The cloud is passing away!' Eldred cried. "'I can see the top of St. Paul's!' Surely enough, the cross seemed to lift skyward. Bit by bit, and inch by inch, the panorama of London slowly unfolded itself. Despite the sooty flood, a flood gradually growing cleaner and sweeter every moment, the streets were filled with people gazing up in fascination at the aeroplane. The tumult of their cheers came upwards. It was their thanks for the forethought and scientific knowledge that had proved to be the salvation of London. As a matter of fact, the high explosives had only been the indirect means of preserving countless lives. The conjuring up of that heavy rain had been the real salvation. It had condensed the fog and beaten it down to earth in a sooty flow of water. It was a heavy, sloppy, gloomy day, such as London ever enjoys the privilege of grumbling over. But nobody grumbled now. The blessed daylight had come back, it was possible to fill the lungs with something like pure air once more, and to realize the simple delight of living. Nobody minded the rain, nobody cared an atom for the knowledge that he was a little worse and a little more grimy than the dirtiest sweep alive. What did it matter, so long as everybody was alike? 
Looking down, the trio in the aeroplane could see London grow mad, grave men skipping about in the rain like schoolboys at the first fall of snow. "'We had better get down,' said Grimfern. "'Otherwise we shall have an ovation ready for us, and personally I should prefer a breakfast. In a calm like this we need not have any difficulty in making Regent's Park safely.' The valve was opened, and the great car dropped like a flashing bird. They saw the rush in the streets, they could hear the tramp of feet now. They dropped at length in what looked like a yelling crowd of demented Hottentots. 6. The aeroplane was safely housed once more. The yelling mobs had departed. London was bent upon one of its occasional insane holidays. The pouring rain did not matter one jot. Had not the rain proved to be the salvation of the great city? What did it matter that the streets were black and the people blacker still? The danger was averted. We will go out and explore presently, said Grinfern. Meanwhile, breakfast. A thing like this must never occur again, Hackness. Hackness sincerely hoped not. Cynthia Grimfern came out to meet them. A liberal application of soap and water had rendered her sweet and fair, but it was impossible to keep clean for long. Everywhere lay evidences of the fog. "'It's lovely to be able to see and breathe once more,' she said. "'Last night every moment I felt as if I must be suffocated. Today it is like suddenly finding paradise.' "'A sooty paradise,' Grimfern growled. Cynthia laughed a little hopelessly. "'It's dreadful,' she said. "'I have had no tablecloth laid. It is useless.' but the table itself is clean, and that is something. I don't think London will ever be perfectly clean again." The reek was still upon the great city. The taint of it hung upon the air. By one o'clock it had ceased raining and the sky cleared. A startled sun looked down on strange things. There was a curious thickness about the trees in Regent's Park. They were as black as if they had been painted. The pavements were greasy and dangerous to pedestrians in a hurry. There was a certain jubilation still to be observed, but the black melancholy desolation was bound to depress the most exuberant spirits. For the last three days everything had been at a standstill. In the thickly populated districts the mortality among little children had been alarmingly high. Those who had any tendency to lung or throat or chest troubles died like flies before the first breath of frost. The evening papers, coming out as usual, a little late in the day, had many a gruesome story to tell. It was the harvest of the scare-line journalist, and he lost no chance. He scented his gloomy copy, and tracked it down unerringly. Over two thousand children, to say nothing of elderly people, had died in the East End. The very small infants had had no chance at all. The Lord Mayor promptly started a mansion-house fund. There would be work and to spare presently. Meanwhile, tons upon tons of machinery stood idle until it could be cleaned. All the trade of London was disorganized. The river and the docks had taken a dreadful toll. Scores of laborers and sailors, overtaken by the sudden scourge, had blundered into the water to be seen no more. The cutting off of the railways and other communications that brought London its daily bread had produced a temporary but no less painful lack of provisions. "'It's a lamentable state of things,' Grimfern said moodily, as the two trudged back to Regent's Park later in the evening. It was impossible to get a cab, for the simple reason that there was not one in London fit to be used. But I don't see how we are going to better it. We can dispel the fogs, but not before they have done terrible damage. "'There is an easy way out of the difficulty,' Eldred said quietly. The others turned eagerly to listen. As a rule Eldred did not speak until he had thought the matter deliberately out. "'Abolish all fires throughout the metropolitan area,' he said. "'In time it will have to be done. All London must warm itself and cook its food and drive all its machinery by electric power.' then it will be one of the healthiest towns in the universe. Everything done by electric power. No thousands of chimneys belching forth black poisonous smoke, 
but a clear, pure atmosphere. In towns like Brighton, where the local authorities have grappled the question in earnest, electric power is half the cost of gas. If only London combined, it would be less than that. No dirt, no dust, no smell, no smoke. The magnificent system at Brighton never cost the ratepayers anything. Indeed, a deal of the profit has gone to the relief of the local burdens. Perhaps this dire calamity will rouse London to a sense of its dangers, but I doubt it." Eldred shook his head despondingly at the dark chaos of the park. Perhaps he was thinking of the victims that the disaster had claimed. The others had followed sadly and Grimfern, leading the way into his house, banged the door on the darkening night. End of story two.